start recording on my computer. Okay, here we start a conversation with, I'm very proud to talk uh, today, tonight, uh, to Richard Lohenberg. He's one of the big pioneers of rural design based on the meeting of the physical and the informational. So uh, rural design is not just a design of material phenomena. It is the design of the whole ecology of the material and the immaterial, the informational. And uh, Richard is a person that spans this whole scope between the material and the informational. And uh, I would like simply to have you tell us about your work. Um, I know that you are active uh, since the 1970s in the domains of architecture, telecommunication, new media, art and theater. You are active in networking of rural communities, but also in the planning domain, uh, planning also of regional ecosystems and uh, also of networks and network appropriate human habitat. And uh, you are also very eager to give us examples for the ecological understanding and uh, the understanding of the relations to the world of information. I just simply want to make a, a short introduction also uh, relating to your places. Uh, you, your work brought you uh, from uh, your birthplace in Israel in 1946 to New York, San Francisco, and more, more uh, later on, uh, it brought you to villages and uh, small towns. And there are three, three, it's a triangle in your life, uh, three uh, exceptional locations. The one is Telluride, a small town in the mountains of Colorado, or rather a village, where you founded also the Telluride Institute and were uh, the uh, director of the InfoZone project, uh, first rural internet point of presence in 1992. And then uh, you moved uh, to Davis in California and you built up uh, the Davis Community Network and uh, eventually uh, it uh, happened that you went to Santa Fe and founded the First Mile Institute. And uh, your life is so rich that I would just like to give uh, a short, uh, our, our viewers a short, you'd give our viewers a short impression uh, of the highlights of this journey. And I, I would like to put some questions in between. Richard, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Franz. Pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. So shall I just start uh, showing some images? And I will, if I do, uh, we have quite a few uh, on my uh, desktop here. So we will move through them very quickly. And I would uh, recommend that if people are interested, um, they can be in touch with me or with or through Franz or with me later on. Um, happy to talk to people who have uh, shared interest in the things we're going to be discussing. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, so um, I grew up, uh, I was born in Israel, Palestine, British Mandate, Palestine. I came to the U.S. with my parents who were German Jewish refugees from World War II. Uh, they were not Zionists, so we came to the U.S. Uh, in 1951 when I was five years old. And essentially, I uh, went to school and grew up uh, as, a, as a U.S. American little kid. Um, and uh, But with uh, 
always a feeling of being a bit of an outsider and uh, actually learning to appreciate uh, that concept of being an outsider uh, because I was a creative kid and I'm a creative adult. Uh, I feel fortunate. Uh, and uh, cr that creative understanding, a creative vision requires stepping outside uh, of the thing you're looking at. Uh, it is really, as we deal with uh, ecology and our uh, human actions uh, on our planet, um, that's one of the problems. It's very hard for human beings to be outside of their own context and therefore have uh, a sense of perspective uh, that comes from being outside. Our space program gave us a view from the outside long ago, which has shaped uh, the perspective of many of us in terms of realizing we are local, our body, our mind, we are physically local, and yet we are planetary, we are global. And uh, that concept and my early, uh, I studied architecture and, uh, and filmmaking and media and long ago and was very, very fortunate to uh, spend time working with Buckminster Fuller uh, during the beginning of his World Game uh, days and also uh, interned one summer uh, in 1967 with Paolo Soleri in Arizona. Uh, and I had some wonderful influences, mostly in the design, architecture, planning, uh, furniture design, landscape planning. I had a very diverse background in terms of actual work. And uh, as a young man in my, around age 20, I was uh, opening myself up to other influences which were dominant at that time. And those included uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, uh, which were both a distraction and a formative experience. And also um, information sciences, cybernetics, uh, and, and so on was very influential. And I started thinking uh, that, and, and having a sense that I was more interested in our information environment than I was in our physical environment. I felt there were many, many people working on buildings and architecture and community planning work, which I was involved in, uh, but none of them at that time, around 1970, late 60s, uh, were really talking about our information environment. Uh, and, 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 and what I eventually called an ecology of our information environment as we talk about uh, an ecological understanding of our uh, biotic or energy environments. According to physics, our universe and our local selves are made up fundamentally of uh, information, energy, and ultimately matter. Um, and I thought uh, we are playing now remarkably in our information environment. We have learned to ride the waves. We have learned to be in tune uh, as, as all living creatures are with our electromagnetic spectrum. And through the work of Tesla, Marconi, many others, uh, we have learned to actually manipulate the electromagnetic spectrum uh, for our communications purposes. Uh, we all live in an electromagnetic environment and uh, I think it's a wondrous understanding. And yet my sense is that we are polluting and uh, actually harming our information environment because we don't think about it ecologically. And that became a life's path. I thought to myself at age 21, as I started integrating design, uh, and the new new understandings about ecology, um, I thought this needs to be applied to our information environment. Others are applying it to other aspects of our real life and real world. Uh, but I didn't know many people really thinking about our information environment ecologically. And I thought, well, that's a life's work. Uh, time to get on with it. So in, uh, in the early 70s, I moved to California very specifically 
to initiate or try to initiate an art science collaboration with NASA to explore some of these areas. And initially, very specifically, I was interested in uh, sensing our environment using uh, the tools, uh, electronic technologies, uh, biotelemetry systems, NASA, satellites, sensing our, our planet and so on as the basis for creative works. Um, and I will um, bring up some images now. And I'm gonna move through these images very quickly. So this is just a, uh, an image I played quite a bit at NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley in California and did many, many projects, including um, taking performers through astronaut gravitational simulation training in the KC-135 so-called Vomit Comet, underwater neutral buoyancy uh, and uh, centrifuge spinning at three Gs and many other things. Um, as you can see from the image, uh, I was also doing work with multispectral imaging technologies uh, and also with uh, uh, animal communications at that time, uh, which I don't think I have images of, but I worked with marine mammals and with Coco the gorilla and uh, through that work with other uh, large higher primates uh, for many years. Uh, these were all long-term projects, not short, uh, short duration projects, uh, one after another after another. These are long-term initiatives. Um, There we go. Whoops, I will close that. Are we still on? Yes, of France? course. Yes, yes. And I Good. I just want to load the images. Side. So you can. Pardon me. Uh, as I, I, uh, in Zoom, you have the possibility to make a little bit of uh, directing. Uh, if you have to look at the speakers, then you can you can shift uh, the images to the small left, or you can shift the, the speakers and become let them become small to the right. So now the image is big. All right. and can you see this image fine? Yes, we can see it fine. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move through these images. Yeah, but, but give us a, a little bit of, uh, it's not so legible, uh, it's not so readable. Uh, we should uh, know what, uh, what, what, uh, what uh, is in it in detail, maybe? So you have yeah, a, so this... you have a conceptual map here of of uh, uh, integrated ecology, I suppose. Yes, yeah. This was one of many kinds of diagrammatic uh, drawings I would do um, to conceptualize uh, the work I was doing at that time with design, waste recycling nutrition and remote sensing, et cetera. I won't go into the details of this. Okay. Um, I also was supporting myself by, uh, whoops, yep. doing architecture uh, and uh, mostly uh, energy efficient um, residential projects, um, passive design. So this is one of a number of, uh, homes that I designed. I worked very closely with a contractor, lovely man who actually uh, I would design, he would, he and his family would build. Um, okay. Uh, all right, uh, these are all different sizes, uh, but this is the home I built for myself and my partner Elizabeth in Telluride, Colorado. Um, both the main house and my metal clad uh, art studio, design studio on the side of the home. Today uh, this I, was at... Today I was looking Go ahead. up, today I was looking up uh, Telluride in Wikipedia and uh, the various ideas about the origin of the name. Um, and, of the uh, earth, earth. Earth. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but uh, one one nasty interpretation is uh, we have a little bit of double sound here. Uh, I hope it won't show up too much in the final presentation. Uh, tell you right to the hell you right. So it's a little bit uh, yes, a little rough bit, uh, climate. Rough climate. 
Well, uh, To Hell You Ride was what uh, Telluride uh, in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s was a mining community. Very uh, rich uh, uh, silver, silver and, and silver and silver mining in that area, 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 other area other telluric, telluric elements, elements. Uh, in that area. And the miners, it was a very rough life. Uh, and it was a very isolated place high in the mountains. Our home here is at, uh, I don't know in meters, but is at uh, uh, American measurement in feet, is at altitude nine, uh, it's at over 9,000 feet altitude. Uh, Jesus. Uh, uh, in fact, the Telluride town, uh, the historic valley floor community is at uh, eight, seven, four, five feet, 8,745 feet altitude. Uh, so very high up, uh, a, a lovely place. And I went there in 1979 um, to work with my dear friend and longtime colleague, John Lifton from London on, uh, we got the contract to do the master planning for the Telluride region as it would become move from becoming a former dying mining town to a new tourist-based ski resort community in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, when we did that planning, we recommended that we do much more whole systems planning and think e economically and socially about the future of this community beyond just ski tourism and, uh, and exploitive uh, economies. Um, so, uh, and, and that has been a great compromise. Uh, much of it has happened. It's a lovely place. I have an ongoing love affair with this community. And, uh, uh, and also it has uh, uh, succumbed to all of the problems of our society today. Uh, okay. By doing everything right, doing really good design in that place in the late 70s and through the 80s and into the 90s, I actually, as a planner, decided to live with the consequences of my work, not to just be a consultant. Um, so I lived there for 18 years approximately and continue my relationship with Telluride. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so anyway, this is my house. Um, This was a drawing I did, a rendering of the region and the mountain village community, which didn't exist uh, prior to 1984 or so. And now it's a, it's a full-fledged uh, village community, the mountain village it's called. Um, and there is that. There, uh, one of the things uh, that we did in planning the Telluride area was to think in terms of nodes of growth rather than sprawl. Uh, rather than sprawling through this fragile uh, mountain region, uh, we said, let's have little pods or, or nodes of growth. There will be the historic town, the old mining town. There will be the mountain village, which is primarily the resort community. Uh, there are three other communities within uh, reach of each other easily and they are and one of the things we talked about was transportation how do we limit the impact of the automobile in this fragile ecosystem in this fragile environment and uh, one of the things i developed in part and that already exists is a regional public gondola system free transportation from the historic village to the mountain village to other areas to an airport, et cetera, all via a gondola system, free transportation to anybody. They can carry their bicycles on it. They can carry their groceries. And, uh, uh, and, and I was really pleased that we created that alternative transportation, uh, public transportation system, although it did not mitigate the impact of the automobile. We have both and rather than either or. Um, and let's keep moving uh, more quickly. Uh, oops. So this is another, so the mountain village we just saw is just under the white cap peaks and another community in the region 
the West Meadows here uh, was another much more eco community based uh, place. Uh, and we were designing, as you can see here, transportation systems. Um, one of the things we did to uh, address the future of this community was form something called the Telluride Institute, which still exists, is very vital. I'll talk more about it later. Um, and uh, we did a number of programs that uh, actually fostered uh, the creation of art and culture and envir uh, watershed environment health and other uh, issues that uh, purely the tourist economy would never address. So we wanted to, uh, and one of the things uh, earlier on when I had been at NASA, uh, I got involved with early satellite telecommunication in 1977, uh, as well as the ARPANET, which was the predecessor of the internet. Um, so I was quite familiar with communications. And when in planning Telluride said, let's connect to, there was no internet yet in the 1970s and 80s, but let's, uh, I, I uh, designed into this planning of this community, fiber optics and satellite telecommunication potential. That was and, at a very early stage. Uh, very. It was, and, and it was not, we were not able to make this a physical reality at that time. Um, it was just too early. 1980 was too early. Nobody, uh, although there was research with fiber optic communication and satellites, nobody was using for public communication satellites and fiber optics. Um, and there was no internet yet. We were actually using early bulletin board systems, BBS systems early on. And I created with colleagues, This was, these were all group efforts with some wonderful people working with me and with me with them. Uh, we created a project called the InfoZone. Uh, and it turned out by the early 90s, just before the internet and the World Wide Web became public, uh, via BBS systems uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, we created the info zone. And by 1992 and 93, uh, we had gotten some early support and had a very robust community wide network with public access systems, since many people did not have computers yet. Um, we created public access. Uh, we had training programs, we had school and education programs, medical programs, government programs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is just one of the screenshots uh, of the pre-World Wide Web info zone. It, uh, it's very familiar as an old Apple aficionado. That's right. That's right. And here's another diagram of the uh, nature of the info zone and how to actually create community integrated with our information uh, infrastructure and services. Uh, very, uh, really, uh, I didn't know and, and still don't know too many people involved in community planning integrated with uh, the overlay or the underlay, the foundation of an information uh, ecosystem uh, that, that integrates with physical ecosystem. That's exactly the time when we started to do Global Village Conference in Vienna to work on the same subjects. Exactly. This was uh, in the air at the time and beginning to happen. Here's an early picture of me from uh, the very early 90s uh, from a Japanese television program. They came and interviewed us uh, and uh, asked me for some consulting advice in Japan. Uh, primarily for the Yamada village, uh, and uh, which was a small rural village in Japan. Um, and one of the problems the Japanese still have and had then was that the rural population was primarily elderly. Young people were moving to cities. And uh, so how do you get an elderly rural population to take advantage of computers and networking and the internet uh, for the future of their community. Yamada Village uh, was completely fiber optic uh, laid by NTT, 
the the national telecommunications company. Uh, I'll keep going through images so we don't take too long. Here's another picture of the town of Telluride and the mountains uh, behind it, very much like a Swiss Alpine village. Um, so we got a lot of attention because we were an early player and it uh, created an opportunity uh, ultimately for me to be invited to do projects and be involved and advise projects in Japan. Almost every year I would go to Japan um, in the 90s. Uh, and uh, Franz invited me to, uh, uh, to Austria to work on Alpine villages and to speak at some conferences and uh, et cetera. I also have always been artist and doing uh, uh, more creative projects in the same vein. Uh, calling it art gave me a lot more uh, freedom uh, from pragmatism, although uh, these projects were all realized. They were not just conceptual. Uh, so uh, created again in the very, this is uh, 1994, I believe, maybe 95, and we were already using the internet and connecting to others uh, who were online via the internet uh, around the world on various systems and uh, and doing creative projects. Okay, I see Ars Electronica and so on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there uh, the Banff Center in Canada, Carnegie Mellon University, Arizona State. Uh, yeah, Ars Electronica in Linz. Uh, uh, Electronic Cafe International in Santa Monica, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> MIT Media Lab. Uh, and we were using a number of networks, uh, uh, Econet, Artswire, Caucus, uh, Indian Net, uh, The Well in California, and the Electronic Cafe to do poetry, literature, uh, drawings. Uh, and, and, and this kind of work continues, and now people do this all the time everywhere uh, using much more sophisticated tools. Um, uh, because, uh, let's see, in 1995, uh, I got federal funding from the U.S. Department of Commerce to uh, create a, an online web publication, uh, a very early web publication called the Applied Rural Telecommunications Investment Guide. And this was uh, a, a book that was on the internet uh, with these sections that you can see uh, that uh, primarily for Colorado, uh, we were asked to, uh, 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 to work with 12 other rural communities in Colorado in the same way we had been working in Telluride to create information infrastructure, to connect them locally and globally and uh, from that time on, I was very interested and concerned about the economics of these kinds of works and the economics of an information-based society where, in fact, our government and corporate entities were telling us that information was property uh, and private property to be auctioned off by government to corporations to rent to us, the subscribers, on a monthly basis. Uh, I, 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 I uh, did not think this was the way to address uh, information economics, that uh, the work much later of Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in 1999, uh, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics, and the first non-economist to win the economics Nobel Prize, and her work was uh, that many people are involved with now and trying to develop, and that is the nature of common pool resources, the commons. And uh, to my thinking, uh, watersheds and forests and the air we breathe are not the only commons. Our information environment is a commons, not private property that we are renters of. Let's so the economics have been very important to me. Richard, let's make a little break here. Yeah. Uh, yes. Because we have already uh, almost uh, 25 yes. minutes video. So we will.
create a, a, a follow-up uh, uh, and uh, we'll start right from that picture. But I would like to, uh, to uh, cut it here and uh, let Zoom cut it. And uh, we we'll do, we'll do a follow-up uh, very soon. Yeah, uh, immediately after this little break. All right, you tell me when. In one minute, <laughs> okay. 